Karina Brienne Saunders was born on July 17, 1992, to Margie Queen and Richard Saunders in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Karina was described as a loving, funny, and mild-mannered individual with a beautiful singing voice. She was raised in Mustang, Oklahoma, and attended Mustang High, where her passion for music led her to join the Honors Choir. She dreamed of becoming an opera singer, but had a backup plan to become an accountant if that didn't work out. She was also both a spelling bee champion and a mathlete. Karina graduated a year early from high school and moved out of her parents' home. However, within a year, Karina had fallen into a rough crowd and began experimenting with drugs. Thanks to the support of her family, she was able to get into rehab. After getting out of rehab, 19-year-old Karina made a surprise visit to her mother Margie on Sunday, September 18, 2011. Karina had a newfound love for religion and decided to go with her mother to church that day. After church, she went back to her cousin Catherine's home where she had been staying. Since she didn't own a phone or a car, she used her computer to post on social media about visiting church that day. Ten days later, Karina posted on Facebook asking her friends what they were all up to that night. She then asked her cousin for a ride to meet up with someone. So Catherine drove her to a Taco Bell off Interstate 40 and South Rockwell Avenue in Oklahoma City. Catherine then watched as Karina got into a mid-1990s model blue or gray Chevrolet blazer with 22-inch rims. After the blazer left, Karina was never seen again. The owner of the vehicle was 44-year-old Kenny Richards, a friend of Karina's. Unfortunately, Kenny was trying to break into the adult film industry and had been trying to convince Karina to be his actress. However, those closer to her thought of him as more of a pimp than an adult film director. After Karina disappeared, Richards was questioned and said the two hung out for a while before dropping her off at the Studio 41 Apartments about five miles away from the Taco Bell. A few days later, a school friend of Karina's named Keegan noticed her sweeping debris off a staircase outside an apartment in the same complex where he lived on either October 6th or 7th. He immediately recognized her and the two began catching up. During the conversation, she revealed that she was staying with the complex's handyman and his son. She was also helping around the apartment complex as a way to pay him back for his hospitality. However, when Keegan saw her again, she said she hadn't eaten in several days, so he quickly bought her some food. He also gave her a black Nike duffel bag to keep her belongings in. He then saw her one final time a couple of days later. On October 13, 2011, Karina was found dismembered in a duffel bag behind a grocery store in Bethany, Oklahoma. When Keegan saw the shocking news on TV, he thought maybe the duffel bag she was found in was the same one he gave her and called the police to inquire. Turns out it wasn't. Investigators began piecing together Karina's last days and determined she was most likely still alive on Saturday, October 8th. Surveillance footage had captured her outside the Newcastle Casino, about 20 miles away from Bethany. In the footage, a man with complete tattoo sleeves on both arms exits a red four-door truck and speaks with her. It's unclear what was said, but afterward, she got in the man's truck, which had other males inside as well. Another vehicle with more than one female in it can be seen trying to convince Karina not to get in the man's truck, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. No one in either vehicle has ever been identified. It's suspected that she was at the Newcastle Casino with Judy Roberts and her younger daughter. Judy would then provide conflicting details about Karina's whereabouts on the day of her murder. It's theorized that Judy and Karina were using drugs together during the weeks leading up to her murder. The following day, on October 9th, Catherine received a strange text message from an unknown number that read, I'm going to bury you next to Karina. This was four days before Karina's body was found. After going to the police, they determined the text message came from Matthew Kyle Savage, who went by Kyle and was friends with Karina for a couple of years. It was also determined that Kyle and Karina had been communicating back and forth in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. When Kyle was questioned, he claimed he sent Catherine the message because he thought they were in a relationship and he was jealous, but he denied being involved in Karina's murder. After hours of interrogation, investigators believed Kyle was telling the truth and ruled him out as a suspect. 
by October 10th, Margie had gotten wind of the text message and became worried that something bad had happened to her daughter, so she reported her missing. This was three days before Karina's body was found. To recap a bit, Karina was last seen by her mother on September 18th, 2011, then by Catherine on September 28th, and then by her friend Keegan between October 6th and October 9th. She was then found murdered on October 13th. After piecing together Karina's timeline, investigators determined she was most likely murdered on October 9th or 10th. Another person of interest in her murder was a cook at Olive Garden named Cody Perez. Cody had suspiciously sold his extensive knife collection to a local Bethany pawn shop after Karina's murder and then hitchhiked out of town. On October 21st, Cody called the Bethany police from Arizona to inform them that he had not fled, but instead moved away after a dispute with another man. He stated that his leaving had nothing to do with Karina, and he subsequently returned to Bethany to prove his innocence. The knives were then checked for forensic evidence, but there was none, so Cody was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. Investigators began looking at a house at 3500 South Harvey Street that was demolished on the day Karina's remains were found. It was a known hotbed for drug activity, prostitution, and violent crimes over the years. However, nothing was ever found that related to Karina. During the autopsy, they found that Karina had most likely been tortured prior to her untimely death. Many portions of her body were missing, and it appeared the killer had attempted to remove her tattoo. Needless to say, Karina's death was brutal, and the killer apparently went to great lengths to hide her identity, even cutting her hair short. The following spring in 2012, a witness by the name of Tia came forward and claimed she saw a video of Karina's murder. She said she was hanging out with her friend Lewis at the Bel Air Motel in Oklahoma City. At some point, Lewis went to the bathroom and she decided to go through his phone. Upon opening his videos, she saw Karina alive while Lewis used a hacksaw on her. Just over a month later, on July 5th, 2012, 37-year-old Lewis Ruiz and 33-year-old Jimmy Massey were charged with Karina's murder. They both had lengthy criminal records and were heavily involved in drug and sex trafficking rings in and around Oklahoma. Francisco Gomez was also arrested, but all his charges were later dismissed. After their arrest, a woman named Michelle came forward and said the two men had kidnapped her. She claimed that while the men had her, she was forced to watch the video of Karina's murder. She was ultimately able to escape by fleeing through a window. She alleged that the men were using the video as a way to intimidate the other prostitutes. With testimony from both Tia and Michelle, investigators concluded that Karina's death occurred on October 11, 2011, in the now-demolished house on 3500 South Harvey Street. Cellmates of the men also came forward and said that Massey confessed to the crime, even offering up incriminating details. Unfortunately, most of the evidence against the men was testimony from witnesses and not physical evidence. So they began trying to find the alleged video. Then Tia changed her statement, saying she hadn't actually seen the video, but rather heard about it through a friend. This was devastating to the case because now it was simply hearsay. In the end, investigators were never able to find the video and realized it was most likely just gossip. The murder charges against the two men were then dropped. Massey even took and passed a polygraph exam. Also in 2012, the Bethany Police Department began having its own internal issues. Not only was the DA requesting they turn Karina's case over to the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations, but the captain of the department, Jack Jinks, was let go and then charged with 11 counts of larceny of a controlled substance. Those charges were then dropped and he was reinstated. Months later, Lieutenant Austin Warfield was placed under internal investigation before being let go. Just like Captain Jinks, he was later reinstated. After Ruiz was released from jail, he filed a lawsuit against the city and the police department, claiming they had not upheld the law during the investigation. Jinx and Warfield were specifically named in the lawsuit, and in 2016, he settled with the police department for $50,000. Once OSBI took over the case, they began looking into Kenny Richards, the man who picked Karina up from the Taco Bell. They discovered that he was loosely involved in the murder of an exotic dancer from a club in Oklahoma City called Night Trips. 
Richards had reportedly found the woman lying in a pool of blood in the living room of her home in March 2012. This was only a few months after Karina's murder. In January 2013, investigators received a tip that Richards had, in fact, murdered Karina and that some of her belongings could be found in a metal tank buried on his property. Unfortunately, the Bethany police already had this tip but never acted on it. They also discovered photos of Karina on Richards' phone. In 2017, OSBI finally searched his property and discovered a septic tank with a woman's shirt, a jacket, and a pair of sandals in it. In 2018, an anonymous donor offered $50,000 for the infamous murder video to be sent to their email, but it amounted to nothing. In late 2020, investigators released a sketch of a person who is believed to have been seen in the last location Karina was spotted in. The sketch closely resembles Kenny Richards. OSBI has also been reinvestigating Kyle Savage, but at this time, no arrests have been made. To me, Kyle's text message about burying Catherine alongside Karina is almost too coincidental. However, as of 2024, Karina's killer has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. James Richard Larrabee, who went by Rick, grew up in Davis, Oklahoma. In 2013, 53-year-old Rick was a divorced father of five, living in Denton, Texas. On September 28, 2013, Rick was back in his hometown of Davis to attend his yearly high school reunion. A few days later, on October 3rd, he sent his sister Julie a text saying he was taking a trip to northern Oklahoma and would be back in about nine days and to let his mom, who was dying of cancer, know. Julie found this strange because Rick wasn't very spontaneous, especially since his mother's diagnosis. She then responded immediately, but strangely received no response. That was the last time anyone heard from Rick. A couple of days later, their aunt fell and broke her hip, so she sent James a text and messaged him on Facebook, but once again, there was no reply. A couple of days later, his mother sadly passed away. Still unable to get in touch with him, she began asking around and learned something shocking from a mutual friend of theirs. She said that Rick had quit his job, cashed out his 401k, and said he was going to disappear. However, a few weeks later, that friend's story changed. This time, she said that Rick was headed into the woods to take his own life. After that, Julie said she didn't know what to believe, but did find out that the friend was right about one thing. Rick had quit his job and cashed out his 401k several weeks before his disappearance, but never mentioned it to her. He wasn't reported missing until 2018 due to confusion between family members, with Julie assuming his adult children filed the report back in 2013. In April of 2015, it was discovered that Rick's 2007 Honda Civic was sold by an individual in Georgia through Craigslist. The buyer confirmed the man was not Rick. Julie then hired a private investigator who determined the car was sold to a female in Georgia in July of 2014 through Title Max. It's unknown if this is the same individual who sold the car in 2015. Unfortunately, as of 2024, Rick has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Awachiji Elise Osceola was born in May of 1986, grew up on the Big Cypress Reservation, and was a descendant of Chief Osceola of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. In 2013, 27-year-old Awasaji was a recently divorced mother to a daughter. After the divorce, she moved her and her daughter to an apartment in Norman, Oklahoma, southeast of Oklahoma City. On September 23, 2013, Awasaji went to a nearby 7-Eleven and withdrew $500 from an ATM. The following day, at 6.08 a.m., Awasaji's phone called 911. When dispatch returned the call, a woman answered and said the call was an accident. At 7.17 a.m., a Facebook post was made on Awasaji's page and also sent to a friend in a text that read, Moose is trying to KM. I'm assuming this means Moose is trying to kill me. At this point, her friends became very concerned and were trying to reach her by phone and text message, but there was no answer. 
by the next evening, when they still had not heard from Owasaji, they left Anadarko, Oklahoma, and traveled to her apartment, arriving around 8 p.m. Once there, they found the door to her apartment kicked in, so they immediately called the police. When the police arrived, they sadly found Owasaji's body on the floor in the upstairs bedroom. There didn't appear to be much of a struggle in the apartment. However, they did find drugs in the living room, along with a beer bottle and some cigarette butts. She most likely bought drugs with the $500 that she withdrew from the ATM on the 23rd. Missing from the apartment was her debit card and phone. Investigators later determined that the debit card was used to withdraw money from an ATM the morning her body was discovered. Thankfully, her daughter was not home when the murder occurred and was with her father instead. Investigators eventually had enough evidence to arrest a suspect by the name of Robert Ross, aka Cocaine Rob, but for some reason, the medical examiner listed her death as undetermined instead of by homicide, even though there were signs of strangulation. Due to this, the DA's office has not been able to file the charges. Rob was seen being dropped off and picked up outside of her apartment the day of her murder, and he was seen on surveillance at the Riverwind Casino that day in the same vehicle. DNA also links him to the murder, but even with that, he remains a free man. An independent medical examiner was then brought in and determined the autopsy was incomplete and lacked many procedures that could have helped the investigation. The independent report also said her neck and contusions on her body needed closer examination. Despite this, in calls from Awasaji's family, the medical examiner has refused to change the manner of death. As for the name Moose she mentioned, she did know a person by that name, but they had a solid alibi and had been eliminated as a suspect. Her ex-husband has also been ruled out. It's possible whoever murdered her posted the message about Moose to throw off the investigation. Unfortunately, as of 2024, this case remains officially unsolved. Sandy Patricia Ray was born on November 25, 1966. In 1984, Sandy was living in Shawnee, Oklahoma with her boyfriend, Danny McLeod. However, Danny had become abusive, causing Sandy to break up with him and move in with the family of a female classmate. Even though Sandy and Danny were broken up, they occasionally still hung out together. During this time, she was still close to her mother and younger siblings and would visit them often. She also had a job at a local restaurant. On September 19, 1984, Sandy was out of cigarettes and told her friend that she was going to walk to the store to buy a pack. However, during that walk, some friends pulled up and asked if she needed a ride, which she accepted. She then rode with them to the Windsor Bowling Alley, where her cousin Jerry Doyle worked. After visiting with him for a bit, she asked if he could drive her to a party, but he declined because he couldn't leave work. At that point, Sandy called one of her friends to see if she wanted to go, but the friend's parents wouldn't let her. So she called several more people, and finally, someone allegedly offered to pick her up. However, it's unclear who that person was. Around 8.30 p.m., Sandy finally left the bowling alley. Since Sandy had a habit of hitchhiking and accepting rides from strangers, the person who picked her up could have been anyone. After leaving the bowling alley, Sandy was never seen again. There were multiple extensive searches for her, but they never turned up anything. However, a rumor in town began spreading that Danny had murdered her and buried her remains in his basement. It was well known that he had become extremely upset and jealous after Sandy ended things with him. However, in 1992, eight years after Sandy disappeared, he was given a polygraph exam and passed. They also searched his basement with ground-penetrating radar, but nothing was found. On top of that, he endured hours of questioning. In the end, he was ruled out as a suspect. Sandy's mother, Carol, was determined to find her, and she, along with Sandy's younger siblings, spent a lot of time digging and searching through local creek beds and bridges looking for her. An investigator in the case believes Sandy did actually go to a party that night, and it's at that party that something bad happened to her. There have even been several accusations that someone covered up the events of the night. In October 2013, investigators received a tip that mentioned a specific location where Sandy's body could be found. 
Officials with the Shawnee Police Department called the crime scene archaeology recovery group for assistance and dug up the indicated area near some railroad tracks, but found nothing. Carol, still refusing to give up on the search for her daughter, decided to become a bail bondsman to keep tabs on some of the people her daughter had been hanging around with, people she knew had criminal records. Although Sandy had never been in trouble with the law, some of the people she associated with had been in and out of jail. At this point, there may be only two ways this case gets solved, either by finding her body or someone in town finally doing the right thing and coming forward with the information on what really happened to her. However, as of 2024, Sandy has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Timur Rafaelovic Mardayev was born on July 26, 1984, in Kazakhstan, a Central Asian country that was part of the former Soviet Union. In 2011, 27-year-old Timur lived in Grove, Oklahoma with his sister and brother-in-law and spoke with a thick Russian accent. Timur was working in the States on a work visa but had applied to stay and work longer. On November 29, 2011, an agitated and withdrawn Timur got in his vehicle around 8 p.m. and left, never to be seen again. It was later discovered that his dark blue 2010 Hyundai Santa Fe was parked in front of the River Spirit Casino in Tulsa for about an hour before driving away. The car was then abandoned over 15 miles away at the Batman's convenience store in the 1400 block of North Mingo Road. His car sat there for multiple days before finally being towed on December 9th, 10 days after he was last seen. After being reported missing, investigators searched his car and found that his keys were still inside the car, along with his GPS, a bottle of Coke, a bottle of whiskey, and a pair of expensive sunglasses. Missing was a green child's Bible that Timur had been keeping in the vehicle as a present for his nephew. The paperwork for his visa application was also missing, along with the coins out of the money change compartment. Interestingly, his car radio was set to a rap station, but Timur only listened to CDs and Russian stations via his satellite radio. The driver's seat was also pulled up, which is strange considering Timur was at least six feet tall. When you consider the fact that Timur had up to $5,000 on him when he left, it looks a lot like his disappearance had something to do with a robbery. It's also of note that Tim Moore also kept his car very clean, but when investigators were going through it, they found gravel in the front and back seats. It's possible he was robbed before he even left for Tulsa because his GPS showed he never made any stops between Grove, Oklahoma and the River Spirit Casino in Tulsa. He also took a different route to Tulsa that day. He typically took the turnpike, but on this day, he used the back roads. Since his family said he was very frugal with his money, they didn't think he would have gambled at the casino. Unfortunately, we don't know if he went inside or not because by the time he was reported missing and they realized his car had been at the casino, the surveillance footage had already been erased. When Tim Moore disappeared, he was depressed due to his father passing away in Oklahoma and his mother passing away a short time later in Russia. He was engaged to be married in Russia when he disappeared. They had plans to marry in February 2012, and then she was going to join him in Tulsa. While he had many friends in Russia, that wasn't the case in Oklahoma. His family said he kept to himself and had no friends. Interestingly, he was known for using the alias Ramir Maruna, and had even met a woman online while using this name. The two had spoken on the phone, and he considered meeting up with her, but his relatives advised against it because of his fiance in Russia. That woman was interviewed and is not considered a suspect in his disappearance. When Timur disappeared, he had a flight plan to Russia to spend Christmas with his fiance, but he never made the flight. Sadly, as of 2024, Timur has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. In January of 1990, a semi-truck overturned in eastern Oklahoma on US-259 near Big Cedar, not far from the Arkansas state line. Inside the truck was a female passenger, and she sadly didn't survive the crash. 
The driver, James Edward Taylor of Atlanta, Texas, said he saw the woman hitchhiking about 15 minutes before the crash and picked her up. James was taken to the hospital to be treated for his injuries. It was there his sister would tell the doctor a different story. She said that James had picked the woman up who went by Beth, or Baby, a few days earlier near 55th Street and Euclid Avenue in Cleveland, Ohio, near a men's shelter. Even with that information, they were still unable to identify her, and she became known as LaFleur Jane Doe. James was then charged with first-degree manslaughter due to the marijuana in his system at the time of the crash. However, those charges were later dismissed. Come to find out, James had an extensive criminal history dating back to the 1970s, including several convictions of burglary, marijuana possession, and driving under the influence. He later passed away in 2008. As for LaFleur Jane Doe, she was African American, between 30 and 50 years old, 5 foot 1 and 87 pounds. The medical examiner determined that she had given birth to at least one child via a C-section. In 2016, state trooper Tim Baker began looking into the case. Using a purple ring that the Jane Doe was wearing, he had hoped someone would recognize it and come forward, but they never did. He then turned to genetic genealogy and had her body exhumed in order to collect DNA. DNA Doe Project began working on the case in 2020, but has only found distant relatives of the victim. The biggest issue with determining her identity is the lack of African Americans in the database. As time goes on, more people will likely upload their DNA and allow it to be used by websites like GEDmatch and hopefully help solve this case. But as of 2024, LaFleur Jane Doe remains unidentified. <laughs>